Service will begin in 15 minutes. Thanks for joining us.
service will begin in 10 minutes. Thanks for joining us.
Service will begin in five minutes. Thanks for joining us.
service is about to begin. Welcome to the worship service of the Central Region of the Boston Church of Christ. We are Valdor and Irene Koha and it is a joy and a privilege to welcome you to our time together today. Um, this is a time of the year we call Advent. Advent means coming or arrival. So it's the four weeks before Christmas that we celebrate and waiting for the arrival of Christmas. Um, we have an Advent wreath behind us here, you can see it. Um, it's our tradition. It's a tradition we grew up with in Germany that we're keeping. And the candles symbolize the light of God that's coming into the world through Jesus. As we were growing up with this tradition in Germany, I did never really understand the full meaning of it because I didn't really know Jesus. I didn't know who he was and what he taught. And so when we came to the U.S. in uh, 1985, a long time ago, and then we studied the Bible and got to know Jesus, I got to understand that Jesus is actually the light of the world, that he is the light of life, that he gives me hope for eternal life. And uh, now we are so grateful that we can celebrate Jesus, that we can celebrate him around Christmas and basically every day of our life. And uh, before we pray, I want to read a famous prophecy from Isaiah who prophesied hundreds of years before Christ arrived. And I want you to pay attention to the names that are given to Jesus Names in the Bible signify, have so much meaning, they signify who that person in its fullest nature was. And if you read in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let us pray together. Father, Almighty God, we come before you and we do celebrate you, we do celebrate your Son who came uh, and saved us, Father, from our sins and gave us life to the full. And so as we come together today, Father, and worship you, we pray that our praying and singing and meditating on your word, our breaking of the bread, um, would be pleasing to you. We praise you, Father. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Offspring of 
the virgin's womb Veiled in flesh the Godhead Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, brothers and sisters. Merry Christmas, friends. If you're visiting with us this morning, you are checking into the virtual service of the Central Region of the Boston Church of Christ. It is so good to have you here with us. My name is Richard. I'm one of the ministers here in the Boston Church, and uh, we're excited to be in the Gospel of John. This is actually a final sermon for the year in the Gospel of John. We're going to be tackling John chapter 15. Next week, uh, we have a Boston Church of Christ service. That's all the regions joining together online to celebrate Christmas. You know, as Christians, of course, sometime around this time, they say Jesus was born, give or take a month or two. Uh, so we look, we're looking forward to that next week. But for now, we're going to be tackling uh, the Gospel of John chapter 15. But before I go any further, I just want to uh, give a special shout out and thanks uh, to two men who have been with me uh, since the month of March. Since the pandemic arrived, we had to, of, of course, everyone fleed for the hills. We went indoors and we redesigned our worship services so we can get online. And these two brothers have faithfully served every Sunday to produce uh, these services you're seeing uh, on a Sunday morning. And I just want to thank Richard Damon and Evan DiBiase, they're actually sitting right across there. You can't see them, but I see them every Sunday. If you get a chance, really thank them. They've done a great job, haven't they? Are really putting together our services. So very, very special thanks to those guys. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we are in the Gospel of John. And this is a time where Jesus is about, is not too far from going to the cross. And John 15 is, is part of one of the longest discourses of Jesus. It starts in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. Now, if you're visiting and you're not familiar with the Bible, you may have opened the Bible and saw those uh, letters in red. Well, that's Jesus talking. And uh, when you get to John 14, 15, and 16, even into 17, uh, that's where he talks the most. It's all red. That, those are Jesus' words. And he knows that his time is short. And he is telling his disciples all that he can about the kingdom, what it means to follow him. In John chapter 15, he is encouraging them to remain in him because he was going to remain with them. Of course, he wasn't going to be with them in the flesh, but he was going to come to them in the form of the Holy Spirit that we see in John chapter 14. And he uses this analogy of the vineyard uh, with his disciples, and they would have been familiar with it because the vineyard often represented the nation of Israel. 
And God's vision and his dream that Israel will be like a fruitful vine and all the nations would look at and envy. But that wasn't always the case. Israel was, didn't always remain in him. And an, exa an example of that we, we see here in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7. This is God speaking about Israel. He says, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So Israel was not always remaining in Jesus, uh, excuse me, in God. Fast forward in John chapter 15, Jesus is now replacing Israel in this discourse as the true vine. And he's encouraging his disciples that no matter what comes your way, I want you to remember that I am with you and I want you to remain in me. And though things may get rough for you, and they did, by the time you get to the book of Acts, you see them going through persecution and all kinds of trials. Jesus is telling them in John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8, that's where we're actually going to stay for today, that you will, if you hang in there, you will experience the joy of bearing much fruit. So my hope uh, this, uh, this morning is that no matter what we're going through in this time, that uh, you too will remain in Jesus. Now, I know Christmas is an interesting time. You know, I, many of us, some of us actually, uh, you have had your Christmas tree set up in, in November. Uh, we love a season like this. And uh, it says, you know, we have songs like, it's the most wonderful time of the year. But for some of us, you know, it's not that wonderful because it reminds us of a sense of loss. I hope this morning that you will be comforted by this message, knowing that God is working in you and the best is really yet to come. So we're going to begin here in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, where Jesus is now addressing his disciples. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So let's see if we can unpack these first eight verses here in John chapter 15. The first point I want to make is this. To remain in Jesus takes a renewal of our will. Have you ever noticed the bedside manner of someone who is visiting a person that they love in hospital? For one reason or another, they are, let's say, in intensive care. And I've been in situations like that where you hear the news of a friend that's sick and you go down and of course you get there and you quietly sort of walk into the room and maybe there are three or four people there. And then there's the person that's really close to them, that they really love and, and who they love. And they're sitting right there beside them. And then another relative may come in and you might hear them say, have you been home yet? And they say, no, I've been here since yesterday. And I, and I called into work and I t I've told them I'm not coming in this week. And I've asked my cousin to bring my clothes. And you really get the sense that no matter what comes their way, the most important thing in their hearts and minds is to remain there right beside the person that they love. You know, another translation for remain in John chapter 15 is abide. It means to hold to a decision once taken. Now, as disciples, I want us to think for a moment, what is one of the most important or the most important decision we've ever made in our lives? I know what mine is. It was the moment that I confessed Jesus is Lord before my baptism. That was, that was like, it was like a, a wedding vow. In sickness or in health, 
in times of prosperity, in times of adversity, from this day forth, for the rest of my life, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. How about you? And you know, following Jesus is a journey, isn't it? It's a journey of joy, of answered prayers, of unanswered prayers, temptations. Sometimes we're confused. God, what are you trying to do? Sometimes it's a moment of clarity. I know what God is, is teaching me now. You know, it's a life of impact, helping other people become Christians. Sometimes we feel disappointment or we're inspired. You know, it sounds like a true relationship, doesn't it? It's a true relationship with God because God is not an idol. He is not someone that just sits there and does nothing. The Spirit has a relationship with us. And He's always working in our lives, guiding us, encouraging us, comforting us, challenging us, revealing things to us. It's a relationship with God. But we do go through disappointments, don't we? You know, I read a few weeks ago about a follower of Jesus who decided that he was no longer going to worship God because he was disappointed that things didn't really work out the way that he wanted them to. And you know, disappointment comes in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes it's sequential. You know, you start off the day and you lock your keys, you know, in the car and it's cold. It's January and your hands are freezing. And then finally, AAA comes and you get in the car and you get home and you get home and all of a sudden the water heater is just busted and, and you know, you get frustrated with that and then you call in to work only to find out that, uh, that one of your employees quit the job and you go, God, what is happening? You ever been through that? Or sometimes it just comes in a big situation where you, you feel a sense of loss or tragedy in your life. You see, disappointment comes in all shapes and sizes. So this man decided to stop praying. He put his Bible away and he woke up every day with no more spiritual practices to nourish his soul. So he set his mind on being rational about everything. Relationships, situations at work, family matters, friend drama. It was all now a matter of reason, relying on his flesh. As time went on, however, the troubles of life began to increase and he found himself just yearning to pray. But he kept telling himself there are other ways to deal with this. So he started going to the bar. He started getting lost on the internet, immersing himself, you know, in long hours at work. And after a few weeks, his old self came roaring back. He began getting angry again the way he used to be before he, you know, he started to follow Jesus. He started cutting people off in relationships. Then he began to secretly drink to dull the pain. And then he would sit there on, in days on end uh, binging on the Walking Dead series. One day, he couldn't stand the darkness any longer. And he fell on his knees and he poured his heart out to God. He got honest with God. He got honest with God about his disappointments, his frustrations, his fear, his confusion. And then through that prayer and through that time, he recommitted himself to discipleship. That day, he felt a peace return to his heart that he had never felt in months. He was excited to think like a Christian again. And he was ready to face the challenges ahead. It was as if life had come back to him. He was now plugged into the vine of Jesus again. Can you relate to that story? Have you ever been disappointed with God? Stopped praying or just gotten too busy to pray? You know, I've been a Christian now for 31 years and I've had those micro cycles of disappointment, you know, frustration, surrender and return and, uh, and macro cycles, right? You know, we all go through that. But the good news is you're not dead. You're not cut off because you're watching and you're worshiping, right? God is always there for us. You know, in verse 5 of John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, I will remain in him and he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, when I read that verse, I realize that Jesus is not going anywhere. He is divine. 
You know, he is the one who is stable. He holds on to us. You know, I love what Paul says, nothing in Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor death, nor hardship, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Jesus is divine. We are the branches. It is our responsibility to do our very best to hold on to him, to remain in him. You know, the good news is this. Renewing our commitment to Jesus is always just a decision away. Remember the prodigal son? I love that story, right? He goes off and he, he finds himself doing things in his life that he never thought he would do. He was just, he's, you know, violating his morals. And he comes to his senses. In other words, he starts thinking right. Then he decides to do something. He decides to come back to his father. And with that decision, he starts acting on his faith. And when he arrives, he thinks that the father is going to put him in the doghouse. But instead, he, he throws a party for him. He's right there. And it reminds me that God is right there for you and me, even when the story gets embarrassing. In Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, you know, it shows us how close Jesus is to the church. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and I, and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with, with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit on my throne, just as I have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. Then he says, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You see, to remain in Jesus, I believe, takes a renewal of our will. The second point I want to leave with you today is that Jesus wants to work in us so he can work through us. You know, it says here in verse 2, it says, He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You know, uh, have you ever felt pruned by God? That God is working in your life somehow? You're not really sure where he's, he's taking you, but you feel pruned. You know, that word pruned, the other words, it means cleanse or, you know, or, or being cleared of debris. You know, God is working in us to prune us sometimes so, so that we can be even more fruitful. Two days ago, from this sermon, I was on Facebook. I saw Scotty Talamac sent a post and it says, I, I'm, it's two years since my stroke and I'm thanking God today that I can now wiggle my toes and wiggle my fingers. You know, it's, uh, there's a story behind that. Uh, Dr. Scotty Talamac, uh, while she was working at Leahy Clinic uh, right here in Burlington, suffered a stroke on the job. And we thought we almost lost Scotty. However, it was very fortunate that um, when the stroke came, that she was but a few feet away from the OR. And her friends who knew Scotty, obviously a lot of these guys are medical personnel, right? They saw you know, her acting a little bit strange and they realized that she was actually going through a stroke and they took her into critical care. It wasn't too long after that uh, she had surgery. And uh, it took her about six weeks to recover. And at one point, she couldn't even move her hands and feet. And so when I saw that post on Facebook, I thought I got to interview Scotty for this sermon because you know, oh, you know, a few weeks before that, I was talking to Scotty on the phone and she sounded so at peace and so excited about her relationship with God. And I thought something has changed in this sister's life. So I interviewed Scotty and I said, Scotty, what was it like during that time? And she says, well, you know, I was in bed for about six weeks and I couldn't move. And she said, Richard, if you know me, I'm always busy, always running here, there, and everywhere. But to sit there and to be still, I began to ask myself, what can I learn in this stillness before God? And she said she came to the conclusion after she was reflecting on all that she had been through that God was so kind to her. And I said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, Richard, 
First of all, it's where, it's, it's where the stroke happened. I was a few feet away from the operating room. And if I were somewhere else, who knows what the implication would have been. God was kind to me. She says, I, I saw kindness in, in, in the people who were there at the time. These are people who know me pretty well, and, and they, were, they were experts in their field, so they were able to take care of me immediately. And then she talked about those who were with her during the recovery, family and friends who kept her encouraged through the time you know, of her recovery. And then she says, and the fact that, you know, that I can walk again, that I, my hands work and I'm back on the job, I felt God's kindness to me. And then I went on to ask her, I said, well, what, what is different about you now versus then? And this is what she says. She says, today I have a greater grasp on what it means to surrender my life to God. She says, you know, before I used to fight things, you know, when, when, when things didn't work out for me, I want a relationship, I want this, I want that. And, and she says, I used to fight God. God, why, why, why? She says, now, uh, you know, all that comes my way, whether it works out for me or not, this is what I say to myself. God is good to me. And she says, now my favorite scripture is Psalm 23, the very first verse. She says, the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. She says, I, I lack nothing, Richard. God has become enough for me because I learned how to surrender my life to him. And I thought about this verse where Jesus, he is saying, you know what? I prune you so that you can even be more fruitful. Today, her testimony is so powerful to all of us, and I hope her faith will bear fruit in your heart. You know, we are right now in the middle of a pandemic, and hopefully there's a light at the end of the, tu of, of the tunnel, right? I heard there's a vaccine. Well, not heard. We know that there's a vaccine, right? It's coming into distribution, and, and uh, we hope that uh, next year, this time, that we will be somewhat normal. But, uh, you know, we've all felt the challenge of this pandemic. Right now, as we speak, so many people are getting sick. People are struggling with isolation and separation. And, and I've been speaking to disciples as I try to call people to find out how they're doing. And I'm really encouraged. You know, a lot of Christians are actually doing well. You know, of course, there's some of us who are going, you know, who are more challenged by the situation. But here are the things that, that uh, some of the conversations that I've had and some of the things disciples have been saying. They said, you know, through this, this pandemic, though as hard as, as it is, I've come to realize how simple life can actually be. Another uh, disciple said, you know, I finally feel more like a traditional family. We're actually sitting down for dinner now. Before, you know, work would have me coming home late, you know, not really paying attention to the family. This thing has slowed me down and now I'm much more present. Another, another person said, I am facing my personal weaknesses and I'm starting to talk about it. I used to just busy myself and numb myself to the things that I had to work on in my character. Now I got no choice but to face myself and I'm beginning to talk about it and getting the help that I need. You know, I, I'm just wondering for those of us who are Christians, you know, God is trying to teach us all something. Have you reflected on what you're learning through this time that we're going through? Like the gardener, God is also the vine dresser. That's another term. And he walks through the garden pruning, pruning the vineyard so that it can be even more fruitful. You know, Jesus himself went through a pruning by his own father. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, this is what it says. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, perfect through what? Perfect through suffering, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, designated by God as a high priest according to the, according to the order of Melchizedek. You know, in other words, Melchizedek, priest forever. So Jesus went through suffering so he can be perfected and become a priest for all of us forever. 
You know, uh, brothers and sisters in the central, you know when I say the best is yet to come, I have this in mind. God is not wasting our time and he is not wasting his time. He is pruning us through this time so that we can even be more fruitful. And I really I want to encourage you this morning that to remain in Jesus, we don't have to force our character. God will work on us so that we can be more like Christ and so we can be even more fruitful. So I want to say to you this morning, Merry Christmas to everyone. Hang in there. We'll get through this together because Jesus is working in us so that he can work through us and the best is yet to come. Let's take a moment to remember our Lord and what he had been through and how he went through his course of trials and suffering and that he eventually would bear a lot of fruit. The church today is here because of what Jesus did for each and every one of us. Let's go to God in prayer as we take communion this morning. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this uh, incredible passage where Jesus is, is encouraging his disciples that no matter what happens in their lives, no matter what they're going through, he reminds them that he is the true vine, the perfect vine, that if they cling to him, they will bear fruit. And Father, Jesus was never asking them to do something that he never did himself. Uh, Father, we know that he was perfected through suffering. And because of that, he sits on your right hand in heaven and we can come to him, we can pray to him, we can have confidence that we now have a mediator who can help us with our weaknesses and our struggles. Thank you, Jesus, for the comfort that we have in knowing that you are here for us, that coming back to you and remaining to, with you is always just a decision away. Because, Father, you will never abandon us, even when the story gets embarrassing. God, we love you so much. We thank you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, church. My name is Kim Walters, and I'm here to share two very good pieces of news with you, both coming from the European Mission Society. The first piece of good news is relative to our special missions contribution, which we took up in October. You might recall that our goal was to raise 1.2 million, almost $1.2 million for all the different initiatives across Eastern and Central and Western Europe. And, uh, it looks as though we will meet that goal. We are almost there and uh, we know several people have uh, pledges and uh, are still intending to give. So we are beyond thrilled uh, in a pandemic uh, COVID world that, that, that the sacrifices of the disciples would be that tremendous. We, we just are blown away. Uh, your contributions are literally going to change lives across Eastern and Central and Western Europe. So thank you so much. Uh, the other good piece of good news also from the EMS is uh, that we have sent over a team of 20 disciples, missionaries. Uh, they are currently in Odessa. They've been in Odessa now for uh, eight weeks. That's on the Black Sea in the Ukraine. And uh, in eight weeks, these disciples are currently studying the Bible with 70 people. So uh, the, the, the fields are ripe and uh, the workers are working hard and uh, your contributions, your support, your sacrifices are such a big part of it. So we thank you uh, very, very sincerely and uh, we wish you a very great season and a great morning this morning. Thank you again. Well, I hope that uh, you enjoyed the sermon this morning. Let me encourage you uh, to cling to Jesus through the holidays. Remain in him and he'll remain in you. You know, God really wants us to live a fruitful life. You know, I have a few announcements for the Central Region. Just want to remind you of our midweek service this coming uh, Thursday at 7.30 p.m. online. So uh, look for that link uh, for that Zoom virtual midweek. And secondly, uh, if you, I just want to also let you know, if you're visiting, please join us again uh, next Sunday at our Boston Church of Christ Christmas Celebration Worship Service. Uh, you, can, you can find us on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, you just go to our Facebook page and click on that link and you'll be right there with us. That starts at 1030. So it's half hour later, but 1030 a.m. next Sunday. So have a great week. Uh, God bless. And let me remind you to remain in him. Bye-bye.